Hi, everyone. Welcome, and we'd like to welcome our very special guest, Kieran Dodds, coming to us from Edinburgh, Scotland. In Kieran Dodds' use of photography, the unknown becomes explorations to inform as well as visually satisfy. He is an explorer of the truth through unexamined subjects, and his work focuses on our commonality as the global human family. For instance, Dodd's images of redheads shot in many different countries reveals the flow of DNA across cultures and generations, and is a reminder that all people are made of the same substance. He is a research-driven documentary photographer, <laughs> combining his expertise in making gorgeous images with his savvy historical approach to the idiosyncratic subjects he chooses to investigate. So Karen, welcome and take it from here. Thank you, Nancy. That's a great introduction. Can I have that text, please? Yes, I will send. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I need to hear that on a Monday night. That's great. Okay, let me share my uh, work with you. Thank you for this opportunity um, to be with you tonight. It's a great, well, today, sorry, I keep saying tonight. It's night in, in Scotland, here in Edinburgh. Um, but it's, it's afternoon where you are in New York, so or wherever you are across America or the world. So the way I'm going to do this is just to give a quick introduction to my work. If you don't know me, um, welcome and thanks for coming. And I'll give you a sort of overview of that over the last 20 years, very briefly, um, to show you sort of bigger themes in my work. And then I want to do a brief exploration of why photography matters. And that is a, a question I come back to um, most days, uh, wondering why I am uh, doing what I do. So I'll do a quick exploration of that. And then I'm going to talk about the making photograph, the process. Um, from the last couple of years, I've been innovating in, in bookmaking, <coughs> innovating for me anyway. Um, so making some books and I'll tell the stories uh, first and then talk about how the book came about from the story and the layers and, and how the design feeds into that. But I want to start with a quote that really sums up my um, life and work. It's by the poet Muriel Riquezer. She says, the universe is made of stories, not of atoms. And as somebody who's been fascinated by science all my life, I've always also been intoxicated by narrative and story. Um, I studied zoology at university, but I was drawn there because of the, the stories of nature and how we are uh, linked to it and involved with it. Um, so I just love this. I just love this, the interwoven stories of the universe. And in a way, my job now is to try and unravel some of those um, so that we may be able to see them more clearly. So back to the zoology days. Um, this is my background for four years uh, studying zoology at Aberdeen University. And we went in our final year for an expedition to Malangi Mountain in Malawi. And on top of that, we lived on that 2000 uh, meter uh, plateau for about two months and I was studying monkeys my friends were studying um, these trees these Melange cedars um, and also the fish and we're, we're studying how environmental um, conservation works in a developing country and it was there I realized I was spending more time documenting with my camera than I was researching and I thought, well, that's interesting, isn't it? I'm finding it, it more natural to process my thoughts and ideas and the world around me by using a camera uh, rather than using data and graphs um, and uh, research. I did an all right um, dissertation in the end, but it, it was a, a sign to me that I should perhaps pursue communication of science um, more than the actual uh, discipline. I then went to uh, train a newspaper or the newspaper group in Glasgow called The Herald. Um, and I would cover all kinds of things, not, not the kind of life I was seeing at university, but um, sports, um, news like this, and just the general day-to-day -day of, of newspaper life. And that was my training um, in the art of uh, visual storytelling, being able to appear on a scene and gather information, collect that data like I was uh, as a, a zoologist, but displaying it in a way that was um, interesting, beautiful, or shocking. And during that time, this photo was part of a collection that um, it won me an award, Young Photographer of the Year in the UK and Ireland. And with that award came a bursary. 
Um, so I was offered some money to go and photograph anything you want to do. Um, it was a limited bursary, but it was a good amount of money in those days. And I wonder what you would do if you had a bursary to photograph anything. Um, and for me, I thought, well, maybe I should do a human interest story, something where there's suffering and we need to alleviate it. Um, and I really wrestled about this. Um, but of course, I was drawn to where my heart is, the nature stories. And I went back to my professor at Aberdeen and I said, um, have, you got any, have you got any stories? And he gave me this tip off of a place in Zambia. So I went out to photograph bats. And I spent five weeks in the forests there with the researchers um, trying to avoid the droppings and all the talk of disease. This was many years ago, but we're all talking about Ebola and coronaviruses then. Um, so it was, it was trying to get away from this much maligned species. I mean, there's no positive um, uh, examples of bats in culture, I don't think. I mean, even Batman was scared of bats. So if you can think of one, please do ask that in the questions or comments. I've still to find one. Um, bats generally are, are seen as uh, bad, and yet they are dispersing forests across Africa, um, and they also are stunning. They're flying animals. They're incredible creatures. So I wanted to show not just uh, the bad things in the world, but the beauty and the order and the wonder of it. The scientists who were there were also studying uh, radio collaring these, these bats, and indeed they traveled thousands of miles across uh, the Congo into equatorial Africa, and as I say, eating the seeds, spitting at the fruits and spreading forests. They're an incredibly powerful tool of forest regeneration. So I came back and this story actually won a, a World Press Photo Award off the back of that a couple of months later. And that launched me into a freelance life. Um, I was able to uh, just see this whole new world of possibilities having met lots of other photographers from around the world. But it wasn't until a few years later that I made that the sole focus at the center of my work. Um, so I'd taken many commissions before that. <coughs> Excuse me. I might cough a bit tonight. I've had a bit of a <coughs> thing recently. Um, so it, yeah, when, when I went to Tibet, it was uh, the change in my business model, I suppose, to put research-driven photo stories at the center. And I applied for a Winston Churchill Travel Fellowship which is an incredible thing in this country. Um, and you say where you want to go, why it would benefit you, actually, your, your progress in whatever profession you're in. And that was what I explained to them. And I said, I wanted to go to the headwaters of the Yellow, um, the Yangtze and the Mekong rivers, the San Jan Yuan National Park, um, where the grasslands have been eroded by the industry downstream. And the Chinese Communist government are do many things to try and resolve this, one of them being clearing people off the land into these um, basically ghettos on the grasslands, places of high unemployment, um, places of culture shock as people are removed, even a few miles, but they're removed from their culture uh, into these uh, urban dwellings. So I did that and it was an environmental story, but humans are never removed from environmental stories. It wasn't like the bats one in a sense that was pure natural history. Um, people are involved in the environment. And then that brings us full circle, if you mind the pun, uh, back to last November. It's a very broad brush stroke here. This is 20 years summed up uh, to save you all dying from exhaustion. Um, but I went to the COP summit, COP26. Um, it was in Glasgow. And how wonderful is that? The, the town I started in photography, um, where they used to say if you could work for the Glasgow Evening Times, which is where I was staff, uh, you could work for the New York Times. I used to think that was wishful thinking to try and keep me there, um, but it was true. And as soon as I left the, the Evening Times, I picked up commissions from the New York Times in Scotland and England um, and elsewhere, laterally. And then this was for the New York Times as the, the sole photographer inside. Uh, documenting the COP summit and outside for part of it as well. So it's a really good experience um, to be there and it fitted in with my wider uh, bodies of work as well. So it really worked in many ways. I got above the fold as well on the last day. What a nice way to end a week of work. Um, it's just nice seeing people, to be honest. And um, November, it just felt like normal life again. <clears throat> people around the world. But you can see this is, I just want to show you a few tear sheets of the kind of work I've been doing. It's not just natural history. 
it is reportage of, of other things. Sports, for example, seems to be uh, a section I've enjoyed working with. Long-term project on a Man City, Manchester City um, footballer, Ilkay Gundogan, and following him in recovery from an injury. Uh, it was amazing access, jumping in their pool. Um, and then I also wrote a story about golf in Scotland, just looking at grassroots sport, uh, just something I'm also interested in here. I do commission work and I have done for years for other people. Smithsonian Magazine has been a great um, group to work with. Um, and it, thankfully, they're picking me up for environmental stories uh, more recently. Um, so they've been great. National Geographic, a few things for them. Uh, and Nature, the ultimate science journal, um, which I would have craved as a zoology student. And I got published in that with the church forest photographs which I'll um, show later on. And again, here's another Seabird Cities. Um, this is it's for a French photo festival um, and it was published in magazines. And it shows a kind of change in my work away from pure photojournalistic towards galleries and exhibitions, um, which is why I've chosen the title Nonfiction Photographer, because I feel it fits uh, in different uh, places. Um, it seems to sort of speak more to where I'm at. Um, it makes sense in books, doesn't it? You know what a non-fiction book is. Uh, it refers to like things as they are. Um, so that's why I call myself that. No one seems to pick up on it particularly. So the question always occurs to me when I'm doing these things, what is the point ultimately? When you see floods of photographs on social media, you think why, why add to that uh, tsunami of information that seems to be flowing at us each day. So I asked the question why photography matters. And for me, it's something which uh, made me laugh when I, when I found this quote. It said, the ubiquity of the photographer is something wonderful. For an absurdly small sum, we may become familiar with every famous locality in the world, but also with almost every man of note in Europe. The ubiquity of the photographer is something wonderful. And the ubiquitous nature of photography is something that has been there since the start. I mean, that, look at the date, it's 1861, and it was ubiquitous even then. And I just love that. And everyone seems to be a photographer, and they were back then, weren't they? Um, but be behind the question of why photography matters is the issue of um, there's too, much, too many photographs. It's so ubiquitous, our feeds overflow. And it bothers me, actually, and, and that's also something that bothered the artist Eric Kessels, who made this a few years ago, the 24 hours on Flickr, kind of dates it being Flickr, but um, a, a million photographs dumped. And it just seems so wasteful and so pointless. And I love the choice of building as well. It seems like it's uh, desecrating humanity in some way. And in the last couple of minutes, I've been speaking, more photographs have been taken than were taken in the entire 19th century. So you think, is there much more we can add to the understanding of humanity as they have? And here's a graph, which I found on the internet a few years ago and I've extrapolated it since, but you see even in 2011, it was going up to about a billion a day. Uh, I'm not sure how they calculate this, but it sounds about right. So um, we can refer to it, but let's go back to, Zero, photo one. In the beginning, Joseph Niepce created the photograph. He said, let there be chemicals and pewter to separate the light from the darkness. And there was photograph. And it was not very good, actually. You can barely see the farm buildings there on the family estate. And it's pretty terrible by today's standards, but this is magic. What Joseph Niepce did on that rooftop near Le Gras in 1826 was solidify time and space on pewter. And that magic has spread into every conceivable part of life today. Today, the problem isn't the volume of photographs. It's the fact we've forgotten the magic. In this image, we have two-dimensional space, represent, two, a two-dimensional representation of three-dimensional space. But more than that, it's set apart because it's got that fourth dimension of time. A photograph is a slice in time. 
How does that incredible process become so passé? And photography matters because it's universal in scope. So you go from the fullness of life, from a dust mite to the vast clouds of dust where stars are born, from dust to dust and everything in between. Or think about your childhood, often those awkward photographs we get on film in the old days or the modern ones. We remember these things, we remember the birthday party, we remember the romper suit. And why do we remember it so clearly? It's because we saw a print and we remembered and we looked again and we remembered. The photograph expands our memory. The sheer volume today fogs our minds. It's no wonder we can't or maybe don't want to remember the last two years because there's been so few significant events. Little is worth printing. So these fragments of time expand our perception of time and help us to see more clearly. And as a photographer, you can help humanity to understand ourselves better and to think more clearly. It might feel like a moment has passed, and yet with a photograph, it echoes into eternity and it becomes a living moment once again. Photographs are objects that remind us where we've come from and where we're going. They're universal in scope, but they also cover all subjects the human mind can inquire. Photography matters because it's universal in application, and so is everywhere in life. It's universal in, sc in scope, but also in application. So you've got um, flying cameras, you've got submersible cameras, you've got helmet cameras, space cameras, phone cameras. There's a near infinite number of applications. And if I could see you, the room I'm speaking into, I'd ask you to hold up the camera that you've got in your hand, your phone, and shine your light, and you'd see it like a Beyonce concert or the camera that's staring at you, you now on your computer. The camera's everywhere, they're so ubiquitous, and that's because it's universal in scope, but also application, it's useful. And until the 1960s, researchers reckoned about half of all photographs were people's children they were taking. So as the population has grown, that's gonna increase as well. <coughs> and the universal nature of it comes from the fact that they mimic what our eyes and brains are already doing. So our eyes are cameras, aren't they? They've got a lens, they've got an iris aperture, they've got a retina sensor at the back, which is a digital sensor. But our eyes don't just gather data to store it. They gather it to understand it, to process it. And likewise, photography can help us understand the world we're in. And so when we looked at that graph earlier, we might have been overwhelmed by it. But in fact, it's incredible. It shows how amazing human beings are that we're interested in so many things in the universe. Mostly dogs and cats, it seems, but they are interesting in their own right. So why bother with these things? Because photography matters because it's universal in scope and application. It's part of who we are. It's part of our way of exploring the world. It's important to us to help us think clearly. Now, Stefan Stag Sagmeister here, New York-based uh, designer. I met him in Glasgow a few years back. And he was on the film Helvetica, which I hope you've all seen. Um, again, a great New York font. But he said Helvetica is, uh, talking about its universal appeal, he said, bad taste is ubiquitous. So it's not just photography that's ubiquitous, but bad taste. But that's a problem with the human heart. So if there's a lot of bad photographs out there, it's because of, What's in here? Garbage out is because of garbage in here. So we can work on that. So I've got a couple of quick things. If you go away with anything tonight, there's a, a couple of uh, quick fixes to help you go forward. One is to make photographs. So rather than have a consumerist mentality of taking, and we use that word anyway, just to take photographs. And that's, you just see it off the cuff and I do too. But think about making, it's a creative, it's an actual uh, creative process, a making process rather than a consuming process. Be proactive in curating your thoughts. Ask yourself before you take or make the picture, what is it I'm seeing? And one of the best ways you can do this actually is to do the second point, which is kind of like the first. Make photographs, make actual physical manifestations of digital prints. <coughs> Because today our pictures are these, um, they're like disembodied ghosts, aren't they? In a, a purgatory cloud floating around to be lost forever. It's not 
chemical on pewter or ink on fiber. Think about how many thousands of pictures you have in your phone. On the way home tonight, go and print some, make something new, enjoy it, revel in that moment, expand time with a photograph on your wall. But also apply that logic to your digital content. Don't burden your, your neighbors with oversharing on Instagram, but serve them, be succinct, edit is a loving act for your neighbor. So make photographs and make photographs. Which leads nicely into the second main part of what I'm talking about tonight. <coughs> Making books. Because of course, this for me is a manifestation of these digital images and something which occurred in lockdown. Again, a time when we became more and more online, detached um, and non-physical in our interactions. And so I think that was partly why I went into this. There's other reasons as well, which I'll explain. But for me, the making process is almost the completion of the photography. It's the sharing of that joy, that moment, or perhaps it's a moment of outrage. But it's also, it comes from um, my background in print journalism, the excitement of getting the, the newspaper. An evening newspaper would come out in the morning, um, the mid-afternoon, then the evening. And I used to love it. You come back from a 6 a.m. shift and you'd have a print copy with your photograph in the front. And it's that thrill of, of making something, um, an idea, vis visible, physical and tangible, that excites me about photography. But of course, books are ubiquitous. They've been around forever. This is a quote from 3000 years ago. Of making many books, there is no end. And much study wearies the body. So be reassured students, if you're studying hard, you'll be tired. Um, or anyone working, you'll be tired thinking. But it's also good to know that 3,000 years ago, they had enough books to fill an Amazon depot um, and then some. They had enough knowledge. And yet, it was a good thing. This is written in a book for us to, to read about. It's how humanity uh, pushes on development and knowledge. So I thought I might just jump on that, uh, even though there's a lot of books in the world. It's ubiquitous, but let's get involved. <clears throat> because... My first thought was like, why bother? There's so many out there. Just as uh, lockdown hit, I was due to be flying out to LA two years ago, almost exactly. Um, Scotland went to lockdown two, week, two years ago on Wednesday, but it was about now I was meant to be going to LA for this group exhibition. I had the work over at, at the right-hand side there um, called To Bow and To Bend a group show about this, the role of uh, trees and spiritual, um, the spiritual significance of them in art in uh, West Hollywood. So as many of you going out there, giving a talk that night, and uh, of course, the borders started closing and the virus was spreading and my commissions were fading. And so at that point, I had to do something, which was to send out lots of invoices. Um, but then I continued to work. And on my daily exercise, I would go out for a, a patrol around uh, the streets. You got one trip out. Um, and I noticed where I live, there was in the bungalow belt of Edinburgh, it's called. It kind of encircles the pretty bit. If you've been to Edinburgh, you'll know the pretty bit um, in the middle of the World Heritage Site. But around that, we've got these bungalows, low rise, 1930s dwellings, of which I own one, um, which <laughs> is a great house. Um, they weren't something you aspire to as a child. But anyway, it's surrounded by um, hedges, very suburban, but very close to the city centre. And I noticed that the hedges had taken on this new sense of purpose. They'd become a metaphor of self-isolation and protection. Um, and at a time where borders across the world were closing, I noticed that people were shrinking back into the most basic border of all, which is the, the home unit. And so I started going around exploring this so I was shooting just to keep myself um, sane and happy and to get out and actually it was a wonderful time in some ways apart from the creeping dread that everything was about to end uh, it was good just to be out and uh, under under a canopy and it's just interesting the differences between hedges so this person clearly is happy with with outsiders but not their neighbor 
you know, and isn't that true of politics uh, of countries? We want we want everyone to come in apart from the person in the country next to us, maybe. So it's got these political connotations, which um, we're kind of slightly inspired by. I was actually, I just put this on for you because I know a lot of you are American and I thought if you're ever in London, you'll see the American embassy because I know that's the first site you want to see, of course, not Big Ben or the palace. But down in the South Bank here, I was getting a, a visa so I can come back to the States over the next couple of years. And hilariously, I noticed around it, the first line of defense is a double border hedge. I mean, you're American, so you have to, you have to like take it up a level. It's a double border hedge, steel reinforced. I mean, that's impressive. It's the kind of British, but like with American twist. Um, you can just walk through actually, there's a path. But um, if you're trying to storm the embassy there, I'd suggest you take a hedge trimmer. Um, and I'd also suggest you don't storm the embassy in London. The other thing to note on this is to the left-hand side, you've got a huge building, uh, big and shiny, Penguin Random House, and also Trans World Publishers. <coughs> Whenever it comes to making books, people will say there's no money in books. And I want to say that's just not true. <laughs> Look at the size of that building. Like someone is making money here. The creative might not, and most writers might not, but somebody is. So that, that was a, a thought at the back of my mind when I went into publishing as well. The publishers tend to make more than the, the, the creators. So I was... In lockdown, I was shooting the, the hedges every day just to keep on my practice. I'd go out with my bike and my small camera. But then it gave me an opportunity because, you know, three weeks to flatten the curve. I thought, great, three weeks to do what I'd written down at the start of the year to do anyway, which was to edit and make my first book. And the first book was going to be this series, which you'll see is quite different from a lot of my work. It does connect. There's um, overlapping threads and interests. But I thought I'll do this one. <laughs> partly because it's been very popular I thought at least I've got a chance at uh, breaking even with this and not bankrupting myself um, so I started doing the gingers <clears throat> and the ginger story started many years ago in happier times just before the divisive Scottish independence referendum in 2014 and I was thinking about cliches of national identity and I realized as I looked in the mirror that I am one of them I'm pale and I'm ginger Everybody thinks Scottish people look like me. But in fact, only 13% of us, although the highest in the world, would be ginger. And so even then, it's a very, very small amount of people, 13, one, one in eight people, roughly. And so I started researching online and found out very quickly, it's actually a global trait. And that intrigued me greatly. Um, but also there was our historical trait which will, um, aspect, which I'll show you. But this map, which is totally dubious, I wouldn't trust it with a barge pole, but I loved it because it is, you know, it rings true. You've got Wales and Ireland and Scotland there in red, the Celtic fringe, let's call it. And then over to the right in Russia, this big hot spot. I assume that's a redhead hot spot, not something else. But that intrigued me. And, and that was something I, I was able to go over and visit um, a few years later in Russia, which is always the country, the other, the unknown, um, and more so than ever, I suppose. But it was it, even at that time. And then I was visiting the National Gallery of Scotland on the mound in Edinburgh. And I went into this early Renaissance room um, and it was full of Botticelli's and um, uh, Titians and uh, Poussin, all these amazing painters. And I noticed that in almost every single one, the main character was Ginger, without fail actually in that room. And I thought, what is going on here? Is this to do with the Scottish audience? You know, they're buying for the Scottish audience. Um, but it, it's something that's rang true everywhere. everywhere. Please try it in your local uh, museum with the Renaissance art. Um, and it was always on the main characters. And these are Middle Eastern characters painted by Southern European artists, but they're ginger. So uh, that was kind of informing my aesthetic of how to take this forward. And also it's depicting the divine because you see the halo there is golden as well. So it's like a hairy halo. Uh, on their heads and obviously Venus uh, isn't a person really but um, she doesn't look that ginger in this picture because I think the, the picture's bad but the painting does shimmer it's this kind of golden divine um, gold flowing down her 
And so I did some test shots. I got a call out with friends and I've got some ginger friends. So I got them in. I bought a roll of Pete Brown um, paper from Calumet, which I'm pleased to say is still going nine years later. So that's been good value for money for a Scotsman. Um, and I got this continuous LED light and a, a, a diffuser, Octobank diffuser. And that's all I used. I'm a simple soul and I just wanted to test myself in my portraiture, keep it simple, non-professional models, simple light and see what I could come up with. Uh, and this is the rig, this is a setup I've taken around the world um, on various shoots and uh, I'm hoping to do more actually in the next couple of years, which you might hear about. So I turned this picture of the Mackays, this incredible family, um, into the one you've seen already tonight. It took a bit of fighting uh, and crying, mostly them, some me, um, to get this image. And a friend who was with me at the time just said, I would have given up long ago. But when you've got a family like this, you've got, you've got to make a picture out of it. You've got to persist. It's a thing of wonder. Um, and so that was the moment I thought, this, this is going to work. And so I carried on around Scotland, just showing the Scottish people. And again, trying to show there's diversity in even an uh, apparently homogenous group. We group people now, don't we, by identities. But in each of those groups, there's great diversity within that group. It's crazy in some ways to write groups off by one label. And this wee lad from Inverness, wee Highland laddie, is the epitome of, of the story. He has a mother who's from Eastern Europe and his father's from the Middle East. But they settled in Scotland. He was born in the Highlands. He's a Scots boy. And I just love that. It just shows that human beings are this wandering species um, and that we have always been so. And through this hair, you can connect people across cultures. You can show, as Nancy said, that we're made of the same stuff. And with this hair color, it really shows. And this is in Russia. Uh, a couple of sisters in Russia, again, showing that incredible hair color and look that is very typically Russian. And Israel as well, Gilad. And Jamaica. So that was a surprise. But actually, it was one of the first things I came across when I was doing the research because um, the professor, uh, Paul, Professor Rees, who, who discovered the ginger gene, MC1R, in Edinburgh, um, actually did research, he was a skin uh, dermatologist, so he did research on melanoma, skin cancer, in Jamaica. So I was reading his research um, when I first got into this and realized there was Jamaicans who had darker skin but yet red hair and they were susceptible to skin cancer. And so even back then I wanted to go there and it, it was the final installment before um, lockdown struck. Just some incredible Leon Swaby and Jamaica, again, is a place where out of one, um, out of many, one nation is the title of, of the, the motto of the country. And it's just wonderful how um, they, they accept that. They're from many backgrounds. And yet the history is just successive ways of um, invaders and colonizers. Um, first from the, the continent, the Sarawak Indians, and then you have the French or the Spanish conquistadors and the French and the English and the Scots. And yet, um, this beautiful legacy as well in these beautiful people. Uh, and it's always done strangely well. I'm always, it's got a life of its own, this story. Sometimes stories uh, you have to push and push. Others, they just kind of, uh, you've just got to hold on and hold on. And it's done well going around the place. And it's found life in exhibition, actually, more than uh, other ones as well. So this is on hoardings in Dundee. That was part of the show to make the portraits. Um, and then Inverness as well, I, I showed the Russians and Scots side by side. Um, and I'll show you more in a, in a wee bit. But I want to speak a little bit about the book, how that I, I was trying to get something different across from what had been shown already. And so I wrote this down. This is the first week of lockdown. I wrote this incredible mock-up uh, on the left there. You're, you're impressed, I can tell. But actually, it wasn't far off uh, what we did. I just wanted to keep it simple. It's almost a, a typology. It's a study. It's kind of zool, scientific zoology manual, uh, like the textbooks I used to read. Um, and just very simple inside, not trying anything fancy. Um, and just go through like that. 
And all we had was their names, the country, and when they were born. And the reason we had where they're born is to reference a family album, because it is a typology, but it's also making those connections across the world. It's to show we, we're a united family. We're all, we're all descended, in a sense, from the same stock um, and people. Uh, and that's why sometimes these diptychs, I'd almost make up, uh, it'd almost be like mums and dads, the, the sort of the, the parents of the, the clan, the ginger clan. And I love these pages where you got the different countries side by side and the different dates and it invites people to compare and look at their age and think of how they connect with this person. And actually, at a time when you couldn't go near people, I wanted a book for people to be able to have people and um, to stare at people, to look at faces unmasked. That was what I wanted, to see people as, as human beings and not vectors of disease. Um, and also to do that across cultures politically. Um, to try and see the human being. We also made a, a special edition. Um, I enjoyed doing that just to create something slightly different uh, with three prints, um, an addition of 50 in that. There's only one left. If anyone wants it, you have to buy it. But... Oh, and you go, I love it. I just thought it was beautiful. One, um, one left. And then when the book came out, another flurry of activity. I couldn't believe it. So. You can produce a book and have this great idea and you can fund it furiously by trying to cr crowdfund and get people to support it. And you can ask about that at the end if you want. Um, but the way my marketing strategy, I didn't have one basically. Um, and I tweeted out that I'd made a book about four weeks before it came out so I could try and get some pre-orders and cover the costs of the first print payment, which is quite substantial. Um, and Immediately the phone went and it was the Sunday Times in London saying, can we run an article about this? And so I was, of course, please, <laughs> um, please do it. And then the weeks after that, the Telegraph, the other big news broadsheet in, in London got in touch. And then even then it was not quite, we weren't anywhere near breaking even. I was quite worried. And then just about the time it came out, the BBC got in touch and wanted to do um, an article on it. And it was just like a spike, you know, the graphs. It was just a, a, a very nice spike uh, when all the, the books sold out very quickly. Um, they got me on TV. I find this very novel, to be honest, um, to be on TV. And it's like this, actually. I'm just speaking to myself in a room, but I know people are out there. Um, so BBC Breakfast, that's the sort of primetime um, main breakfast uh, flagship news program. Channel 4 as well, and Channel 5 News. So it was quite a novelty, and I just rode the wave and enjoyed it. And by the time I was on BBC Breakfast, I'd sold out anyway. So I was just there to um, sort of promote world peace and show we're all made the same stuff. <coughs> but the trouble was I'd sold out, and I was getting all this publicity. So what do you do? It was a limited first edition. That was the problem. Or the benefit, actually, because I wanted to do a, a book that was... Um, an artwork, I wanted it to be something that was consistent with the body of work that was beautiful and not just a mainstream publication, um, which was aimed at the mass market. I wanted to please my artistic um, interest rather than just try and second guess what people wanted. Uh, and Waterstones, the biggest bookshop in the UK, bought a bunch um, of the paperback. I made a sort of soft cover version, turned it around in two weeks um, before Christmas, I arrived and missed the last um, weekend before Christmas. And then they closed for three months because of another lockdown. Oh, classic. Um, and Smithsonian Magazine made it one of their best photo books of the year. So that was nice. It was funny times. Uh, I would have liked to have had a book launch. I still never have. Maybe one day I will, um, just to see people. <laughs> and recently, I'm pleased to announce, I've got a little book of gingers. I've just, I've just made this. Um, and it's just coming this week, actually. And it's beautiful, tiny little book aimed at um, reaching more people. And I'm really, I, I just think it's a beautiful little thing. It's different from the other book. It's more accessible in some ways. It's designed on these kids' books we had growing up, Ladybird books. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of, yeah, excited about that. <coughs> <coughs> and these just came into the Scottish National Portrait Gallery last week. Um, this is me uh, looking energetic. Um, a few weeks ago. So that's that's partly why I thought I'll bring out this book. The other one's uh, almost gone. I'm not going to reprint it. 
and uh, I've got this other book to sort of bridge the gap between now and the, the other one I want to do in the future if, if I ever get to go and shoot it. Time-wise, are we doing okay? I think we're okay, aren't we? Um, this I'll do slightly quicker, and then we'll go into Q&A. Yeah, we've got time. That's just 40 minutes, isn't it? Yeah, fine, fine. Okay, just talk, I'm literally talking to myself here. The church force, is that yeah, right, Nancy? Take your time. Yeah, okay, good. Take your time. Just checking your we're, we're enjoying this. Take your time. Good. Have a cup of tea, have a swig of tea. Okay, so the second book couldn't be more different, and yet it's got similarities. But in terms of bookmaking, it was different, and I'll share this with you. You'll see the, the clear zoological roots to it as well. So after the Ginger's book came out, that was January 21. And <coughs> after the flurry of activity, I decided to have a rest, um, to have a few days off, and then plan the year ahead. And in 20, that was, yeah, it was January 21. And so in January, I planned the whole year. And in November that, that year, there was a COP summit in Glasgow, as I mentioned before. And so he, here's an opportunity. Here's a good thing on my doorstep to uh, speak about this project I've had for years. Um, and I thought the gingers have showed me that a book is a great way um, to get conversations going and to give a permanent record of, of something that's happened. And so I thought this year I'll try and make a church forest book and um, to speak about how spiritual ideas have created sustainable landscapes. And the story begins in Ethiopia um, in Amhara province. If you're looking later, uh, or even now, uh, for Lake Tana, which is the biggest lake in Ethiopia up the north, the source of the Blue Nile. Um, and if you zoom into that, all around it, it's, a, it's an area about the size of England and Wales. It's, it's a quite big province. But if you zoom into Lake Tana later, you'll find little green dots. And if you zoom into pretty much any one of them, you'll find in the middle a little circular church building because the last remnants of forest in, in northern Ethiopia surround church buildings. They've been preserved as an act of faith. And it's almost like a, um, yeah, like a, 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 a spaceship has landed. It looks like a fleet of UFOs have landed in Ethiopia and they're emitting this force field, this life-giving force field. And in a sense, it is supernatural. They've landed and they're, they're emitting this incredible force field. <coughs> so it's Ethiopian context. Um, you might have heard of the Great Green Wall. The church forests are not part of it. And that's partly why I showed in the book, they have a network of forests already that could um, be part of this barrier against desertification. But I went there first in 2016 um, on a bursary from the Royal Photographic Society. And I had seen the aerial shots from Google Maps and I knew I had to get them, but this is as close as I got after five weeks in the field. Um, but that's okay, because actually these forests, they're Orthodox Tewahido um, Christian churches. And the texts that inspire their um, sort of preservation culture are the Bible and particularly the book of Genesis. And so in the book of Genesis, I kind of used that as a, a way to approach the story photographically, because in the book, <coughs> we often think of the God's eye view or the angel's eye view as from above, don't we? So those aerial shots on Google. But actually in Genesis 1 and 2, you've got two lenses. You've got God up there, transcendent, but you've got God down here, imminent, walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And I love that. And so I, I knew I had to get the pictures from the cool of the day, walking in the forest, as well as those aerials, and then try somehow later to edit them together. Um, so I spent that time just trying to get access, very difficult places to get access to. I went... Uh, I got, got in contact with a uh, Dr. Meg Lauman, an American um, conservationist. Um, she's National Geographic caller, the Real Life Lorax. Um, she's got a great new book actually called The Arbonaut, which is really um, fascinating, which mentions the church forest in depth. Um, so I got in touch with her and I said, I'd love to come and see these forests. And she said, come out, come out. Um, and she introduced me to Dr. Alamayo Wasi Ashetti, who's the, the man, the church forest guy. 
and he his name was good and got me in many places um, and he's been a great um, collaborator since then as we try to protect them <coughs> this is the Zegi Peninsula so if you go as a tourist to Ethiopia and I, I encourage you to do so soon when all is well um, if you go to Bahardar on Lake Tana it's a great university town on the shore of Lake Tana and you'll get a boat trip out to Zegi so this is lots of tourists go here it's just um, so many monasteries in that forest and you'll see on the map as well from above it's just this rich canopy um, which has been preserved it's peak canopy and this guy in a papyrus boat on the Nile I mean how it's just it's not even for tourists that he's genuinely fishing and in the center of these forests you have the church and people gather quietly in the morning in the cool of the day um, to worship but they also gather for festivities, for every rite of passage, for all the moments of life. It's not removed from life. Um, it's central to it. And people come and go uh, around the church. It's such an intrinsic part of it. And I wanted to show how the canopy has uh, been there longer than the humans. We are like a mist passing as the day dawns. And the trees have been there and the people have worshipped under the same canopy as their ancestors, among the, the sounds of birds and monkeys and insects uh, for, for centuries. So it's trying to show that passing of time, but also the, the rites of passage as well at dawn before the service. And the personalities, the people, and the incredible doors. I mean, look at that. Huge, huge bit of wood. The whole building is made from the forest. You know, the forest makes the church and the church makes the forest. It's this beautiful um, coexistence. But of course, it shouldn't surprise us in many ways because the symbol of Christianity is a tree. It's called a tree in the New Testament. They hang, hung him on a tree. Cursed is the man who hangs on a tree. It's not called the cross. It's called the tree. And it's amazing how simple the Bible can be if you use the tree as, as the kind of the anchor point. You've got the tree at the beginning where it goes wrong the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The tree at the end where it goes right, the tree of life for the healing of nations and revelation. And then in the middle, you've got the tree, this tree, which puts right that curse and gives life to those who believe as they understand it. And but that really struck me when I was out there. I hadn't really thought about that. The Christian symbol's a tree. And it's not meaning environmentalism should then thus flow from it, but it, it's pretty significant, you know? If they give dignity to that symbol, and the Ethiopians get it, um, and others might too. So I spent a lot of time wandering around trying to get those photographs. But at the end of the day, I wanted to get the aerial shots. That was the thing that attracted me to it. That was the thing that blew my mind. <coughs> it took a few years, a few states of emergency, some in country, some at home. We had twins. Um, but finally, I managed to get funding and to get back. And I, I flew for the first time over this church. That was the one there, which I'd been to. And my favorite one, um, Gebeta Georgis, which is uh, it's just a beautiful walk-in. I've, I've loved going there every time. Um, and I was able to go there for a Sunday morning. And you can see in the background there the hills. So the first hills where you walk from, we managed to get the four by four to. Um, and then we walked the rest. And in the far distance, there's a kind of little peak which again is another church and disease um, often on the tops of hills where they can connect and see to each other uh, across the landscape. And they all have different personalities depending on how they've been used. Um, they show the nature of the local people and decisions people have made. <coughs> and I love the way you see this kind of interaction between the hand of divine nature and, and man uh, people cutting the corner to go home, the way the cattle chewed at the edge and thinned it out. And that's the problem, actually. They've been protected by faith, but don't, people don't realize they're fading away because the plow goes a bit closer and thins the edge, or the cattle nibble the edge and thin, and it dies slowly. It's dying from the outside in. But when the scientists, um, Dr. Alamayo himself grew up in these forests, and when he goes and trains these priests, uh, they, you almost can't stop them. They want to go and protect them more. They want to build a conservation wall to protect them. Again, a border. It's interesting. This is a beneficial border to keep cattle out, mind you. Um, but they've got gates for people to come and go just to protect the forest because it is, 
intrinsic to human life. It's intrinsic to life in the farm. It has pollinators which benefit the crops and people's livelihoods. It raises water tables for the, the harvesting. So it's vital to human life and flourishing. And on the left there, you can see one of these walls is in place. Um, and it's a beautiful dry stone dike. It's beautiful, um, beautifully made, uh, but also it's beautiful because it brings life again from the rocky soil. The picture on the right is um, one I have in my office wall, actually. And I, I don't actually get bored of it. It looks like a circus tent. But I just love the color. I love the... Um, the fields and each day I see new things and think about the personalities who have carved each field. Every field is known to an owner locally. And yet many of them, most of them are under threat. So they've only built, I think, 20 walls and there are over 11,000 of these. So it's a huge um, crisis. But it's a slow crisis and that's the problem, isn't it? You could raise the rainforest in the, in the Amazon with fire and it gets headlines. Whereas this is a slow, slow um, death. And yet the booming population in Ethiopia has given rise to some hope. So that's a church on the right. It looks like that is the end of that forest, but really it's a new beginning. That's a church plant. So planted the church and they've also, you can see the field at top right and the darker area is the land they've kept aside for the forest to grow. So with the growing population, it adds pressure, but also with the right measures, it actually increases forest cover. And the, sh the show, the second show, um, was funded to go to this gallery in uh, Orange County in a, near LA, um, the Amundsen Gallery. And we also put a symposium with artists and theologians and scientists. And it was just incredible to have all the Ethiopians there. And, uh, the one in the background you'll see this far away, you can barely see it, but it's, a, it's moonlight and this um, lightning struck tree. And I caught some of the Ethiopian guys doing selfies in front of it. I was like, what are you doing? What are you doing? Um, and they were just like, we love this. This is, it's just showing our, our daily life, but in a new way. And I thought that was it, you know, this, because often as, as a photographer, you're never sure, even in Scotland, coming into a place, if you're gonna um, do it right. And that for me was a great um, vindication and encouragement. It's also great to have a massive gallery space, to be honest. Um, <laughs> uh, it's good what happens. <coughs> it also then appeared, National Geographic did an article online. Nature, as I said, it was the first time they'd used a double page in their news section uh, as a photograph. And it was just a great moment for me. A beautiful uh, show. Geo France as well. And very satisfying to get all these things. But for me, the thing, the thing that troubled me all that time was nothing was changing, it seemed. The churches were still failing. And I was, I was really troubled by that. And so the book for me was an opportunity to tell the story, tell the urgency of it, but also to show the beauty and inspire people, perhaps, uh, to support it. So here's another classic Dodds design. I, I get designers in to improve my work. Um, but that's what I wrote down. I like the idea of a map and a journey. And of course, it refers to the church buildings across the landscape. And this is a classic zoological thing. Uh, I did zoology slash ecology. And in ecology, it's about how animals distribute in an ecosystem, uh, why they're there. And it's we just, for four years, we used maps and graphs. It was mainly stats, really. Um, so this is classic ecology, uh, having a, a, a sort of map of animal distribution, human distribution. But it evolved into this, which is a, a road map or a road trip. If it's a classic photo genre, um, that's a road trip, but on foot, a pilgrimage of sorts. Um, so it's a physical journey between the patches. But then I realized also it's a spiritual journey because when, you, when I was in those churches on a Sunday um, or in the, the, the canopy, uh, you realize that divine liturgy was... Um, there was various steps. You're far away and you're brought close. You're unforgiven, then you're forgiven, and then you were sent away. And I thought there's a spiritual journey going on within that. And that was the voice I wanted to get in. This is a, an Ethiopian Orthodox Tewahedo story. Um, and I, I needed to be true to that spirit as well as being able to tell the visual story. There's a better outworking of that. Um, and again, in, in 
the Amharic script that spells um, church forest, the, the equivalent word that they would use um, for church forest. <coughs> and again, showing those dots linking up the forest as I described before. So the way I, I did the spiritual journey is by having these as uh, marker pages throughout it. I'm using these anaphora, which they use in the divine liturgy um, as a call and response or a prayer to sort of keep people on that spiritual journey who have been away from God and bring them close to him. Um, and so finding absolute gems like this, um, like little Zen-like pithy statements, uh, a weak tree carried him who carries heaven and earth. A narrow grave contained him before whom heaven and earth tremble when he was buried in it. And we put it in Amharic and in English. Um, and that, that is the, the way I've broken up the, the photos in the book. There's text at the start, and then it's the photographic monograph, and then it's uh, an essay at the back as well. And there's the Amharic and the um, English. <coughs> We managed to get it to a Bible printer in, in um, Germany who printed the edge red. You'll see why in a second. And there's the rocky ground you can see on this, this plowman around the church forest. So you see how rough the, the soil is. Um, and the forest raise the water tables and help um, sustain that. But also I went right back to the beginning and re-edited the entire shoot. So I just hold myself up for a week and just went through the entire I think it's 26,000 pictures and just, I found new ones like this. I hadn't seen this before and I love it. Um, showing the people's, uh, a sea of people between the forest patches. And then finishing off the book with a, a happy verse. Since we're in New York, uh, I'm glad to say there's a, an aerial of uh, Central Park in there because I want to not, I'm a Western man. I'm speaking to a Western audience in, in many ways. Um, so I wanted to not just say, that's nice. Well done, Ethiopians. I wanted to take what they had shown us of our world and see where it was here. Because if they understand Christianity um, has some impact on the environment beneficially, then I wonder where that legacy is elsewhere. And it actually was quite easy to find if you know where to look. Um, there's a book by Mark Stoll, which I've got here inherit the holy mountain and he shows how it's the he shows in america through art history he uses that to trace the the ideas that gave rise to modern environmentalism and they are religious ideas they're puritan ideas to begin with um, and then they're passed on to all the different christian groups who um like presbyterians will apply them into national parks but it's this um puritan congregationalist spirit of the connecticut valley their understanding of nature and god which actually is, is what inspires modern conservation. Um, you can see it in Greta Thunberg, the Baptist preacher, uh, calling people. But the way, the words, this idea of um, uh, almost apocalyptic language as well, it's, it's very interesting anyway. So I got Mark, I asked him if he'd write an essay for this, and he has. Um, <coughs> and comparing Central Park, which is a place, the designers of that, um, congregationalist um, beliefs had, had been in, um, what's the word, imbibes. And they, they were trying to very much create this um, park, natural, divine landscape within uh, the city of man. Uh, and I thought it was a beautiful reverse of uh, the church forests. And then did a special edition, because it's nice to do that uh, with a print. <laughs> and I was so pleased with this. This is using um, data points from a, a scientist, Travis Reynolds in the States. Um, and he let us use the, the, the points to make a, a map. And I also made these little print sets. Again, I thought I'll, I'll commit to planting a thousand native trees with the book. I paid for that beforehand, regardless of how many were sold, um, to, to contribute to the reforesting. And then I made these little print sets uh, with that beautiful um, gold letterpress showing that map. And you'll see on the right hand side, uh, the, the end paper plus the, the edge and the cover creates the Ethiopian map. So just little things like that make me happy. Spent a lot of time worrying about that. But when I got the Bible maker in Germany who was able to do it, that was just like classic. It's got the seal of approval. And that's these print sets. So again, it's, it's a slightly different thing um, from previously. It's more activist. It's more trying to 
um, make some contribution to the work on the ground and also planting trees. So it's been really nice to be able to reprint, actually, I sold out of them. So it's been able to reprint um, the, the tree sets uh, for, for people with the books. And that is who does that, right. I'm coming to a close here, Nancy. Get, get yourself awake. Um, I'm sure you are, I know you are. Um, but there's a, a few tips I just want to give at the end. I, I wrote down some tips today um, for any of the students or photographers or anyone, or me. <coughs> Take home messages. One, good ideas endure. So it's about the idea, good stories endure. You need help. You do need help, everybody. Um, others need help. We need to help others. Yeah. This whole book process was a huge collaboration. The people I got around me, which people can ask about, um, is getting an A team around you. Um, and also the fact that the book is not the end in itself. It's part of the bigger story. It is a, a, is a, a different aspect of that. Um, and my last point is know when to stop. <laughs> and that's where you're going to leave us. <laughs> yes. We'll get a nice picture up and then people can ask so, some questions. Uh, if you have questions, please leave them uh, for us. Um, John, are you around as well? I am here. I am back. Um, so first of all, I just want to thank you, Kieran. That was great. I mean, it's such a vast like body, like body of works, I should say. <laughs> like such a, you know, diverse going from zoology to portraiture back to nature again like it's kind of I, I, I i'm still looking at your image right now on your website actually so. I, i'm really i'm so blown away and i'm i'm just so happy that you put this together in exactly the way that you did mm -hmm. um I, I i love your insights your especially your historical insights um, along with the contemporary ones and uh, and also your sense of humor. I, I only regret that you couldn't hear the laughter at least on this end and so I'm yeah. sure <laughs> I felt bad I was going to type in little emojis in the chat to you to oh, let you know we were yeah, still here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, John any any questions that are, I haven't looked lately? Um, there have not been many. Um, Okay. Uh, one of them came in and just simply asked, what does photography mean to you? I know you kind of did touch upon that from the very beginning, but um, <laughs> if you'd like to, uh, you know, reiterate or maybe for someone who joined late. Yeah. It's a, what does photography yeah. mean to me? Yeah. Um, That's a pretty open-ended question, I know. It but. is, yeah. We could talk about that <laughs> for a while. I think um, it means so many things. I, I, I think the motivation question is a great one. Uh, in photography people often ask what do you do and I'm more interested in why do you do it and that's that qu question isn't it uh, yeah. why why are you a photographer and it was that thing the first photo I remember taking and I tried to find it to put on this today it was in Canada age seven I had a really smart little safari suit and a little camera we instamatic and um, but I remember taking this picture of a raccoon and I just remember pressing the shutter and it clicked just as the raccoon turned to me and at that moment, I was so excited that I ran to my dad and just said, dad, 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 I got this picture. And I described it in detail because it was film. And I think that is, that is why I do photography. You're able to see something, feel it, and be able to um, capture it and share it. I think that's, it's a share, it's a completion of joy thing. It just, it feels so natural to me. So I do write, I've written in magazines, um, and usually when I've done stories like this, I'm, I'm, I write the article because I know more than um, a, a writer might. Um, the <coughs> I can do that, but really, I mean, I mean, I work hard at photography, but there's a kind of ease to it. It feels like an extension of me rather than like, um, yeah, I, I prefer. And also you're out about taking photographs. You can't take a typewriter up a hill, or you could, but you can't do it as you, it would, it would be uh, less fun. So that I think that's that's it. It's it's the kind of it just feels. Um, what else could I do? You know. <laughs> Great. All right, we have a, a, another question from one of our students. Uh, most of your work is selfless. Is that right? Selfless, compared to many other pho pho uh, photographers I observed lately. 
So that is really moving and wonderful oh. for me. When did you discover this way of approaching your art? Or oh, art oh. and your art? Oh, that's nice to say. Um, I hope, well, I don't know if it's true. You always feel like you're just self-promoting all, all the time online. So I, I don't always feel that way. That's very kind of you to say. Um, I, it's funny you say that as well, because as a, as a young photographer in documentary, it was always the story was more important than the person. And I do feel that's changed. Um, but that's maybe just the nature of the world now. Social media is about me at the center of the world. Um, but I always just think the best four journalists, I, I knew their work. I didn't always know their name. Um, and you understand the world. You were, you were drawn into the work and you weren't stuck at the work looking at the person. Um, so I feel like that was a cultural thing then. So I try, I try and always just think of the story. I'm subservient to the story. Um, and when I have to speak about me and my part in the story, I do f find it slightly odd, but I, I do it in, in that it helps a story be told, usually. So I think just, it's that thing about the universe being made of stories. It's like, we're trying to discover that. It's not like I've come up with this, like, wow, <laughs> look, how, look how smart I am. You know, I've come up with this. It's like the universe has got these things and occasionally we get given these little threads to hold out to people and unfurl. Great. Uh, Nancy, you. Uh, well, there's a, there's a few things. Um, you know, when your, when your girls were younger, they, there was a lot of images, there was a lot of video and, and I really respect the fact that there is not anymore, but I do wonder what their attitude is when you photograph them just for your own family at this point. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Daddy daycare. Daddy daycare was great. Every Wednesday yeah. I used to, yeah. So that started um, because I used to do daddy daycare every Wednesday. And I, I did, uh, as a discipline, I do a triptych on Instagram stories, daddy daycare, like a video or still um, it's Wednesday, daddy daycare. And I did it for, Oh, it must've been three years, four years, four years. Um, and it was great. And I, I, yeah, I loved doing that. But we stopped when they went to school and that, um, yeah, I think that was the right decision. But in terms of the girls responding, they're, they're very good, actually. <coughs> they, they're happy being photographed. They're very compliant. I don't, the, the worst people to take photos of are my parents, my dad especially. I hope he's not tuned in. Um, because you're just like, oh, come on, hurry up, hurry up. Uh, you know, it's always been that way. I'd stop uh, when I was younger and stop for a picture and they'd be wanting to walk off. Um, so I've learned to, to work fast. And I think that that helps with five-year-olds to be like quick. Um, or as a photographer as well, you, you get ahead of the moment. So you should be able to see what's about to come um, as well. So I try not to bother them too much. Um, but Izzy is, is happily, she's got one of my old cameras and she loves to just, she just goes around and takes pictures with it. So she's fascinated by it. Um, and I've not forced that on her. She just... Um, if she wants to play with it, she can. And, and she does really enjoy uh, photographing all kinds of mad stuff. So, yeah, they're very compliant. Second generation. Um, I, I also wondered if there's any ideas, new ideas that you'd like to share or th projects that you haven't done, but that you're, but that you would love to do. Oh, yeah. That, that you'd want to share. Yeah, Maybe. that's the trouble, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. What? Maybe never mind. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. No, I mean, I mean, it's but that that is it. It's like do uh, I I do feel like over the years it's like I prefer I keep it under my my hat until I've created it. I think I think partly I don't like to talk up things. I don't like to say to people, "Oh yeah, I'm doing this." And that's the thing about books. If anyone's going to make a book, just don't say I'm going to do this book, because you'll be saying that for months and months and months. Just do the book. <laughs> and I prefer that, you know, and um, rather, I don't want to be one of these guys who just like a cloud without wind, a cloud without rain, rather, you just, you promise much and give nothing. So, because there has been a, there was a story, which I started in 2020, um, which I did for three months and then lockdown and I can take it up again, but it just, that I'd love to continue that. Um, I was trying to continue it last week, but then I got COVID. So that was, that was the first time starting again after lockdowns. 
So that didn't yes. work. So maybe I should just take the, the sign, take the hint. <laughs> um, and lastly, uh, you've been, obviously you've been a lot to Ethiopia. I just wondered if you had ever, um, if you know the story about the, um, uh, the, Arca, uh, the, the second Ark of the Covenant that <coughs> potentially there. Um, I don't know it very well. But I know they think in Axum that's where they keep the Ark of the Covenant and it's protected and guarded and you can't get in. Right. But Axum, I mean, Tigray, is, there's been, as you know, the, the conflict in Ethiopia, which has um, barely appeared on news, um, has meant you can't go to Tigray now. There's terrible um, issues there. So, yeah, I don't... If you know, if you know the story about the... I mean, Ethiopia, the, the history of the country is, is just incredible just absolutely incredible the way um yeah i, I, I could save lots on that but i'll i'll not <laughs> okay um so That's i think I uh john there's no there's no other questions yeah i mean there was there was another one um and so maybe this is like you know for young photographers what advice do you have to give them like yeah out of the um, game out of, and those who are about to graduate or those who aren't even, you know, even begun their journey as photographers yet, what, what kind of advice can you offer? Yeah. Yeah. You've got to love it and work hard. That's one thing. But I think that for long-term projects, just keep chipping away. I think photographers, we get um, distracted. We get demoralized and you just, you need to make a living. Um, so you'll do commissions and, and, you'll maybe forget about the longer term stuff and then think I'll start that. A lot of people talk about longer term projects. So if you're ever going to think about that, just keep chipping away just a day a month, day every couple of months, over a year that becomes something. Um, almost these foreign trips going away was better because you had that like fixed time, no distractions. Whereas trying to do something at home is, is, is harder. Or like Border Patrol, that was a local story, which um, was every day just chipping away, just doing one picture a day. And then Smithsonian Magazine commission it, you know, and then the Guardian run it. And uh, who knows what will happen next with that? Maybe nothing. So I think, I think that, yeah, I think just don't, don't give up. Keep, keep chipping away. Yeah. Great advice. Good advice. Great advice. Karen, thank you so much for your time. I know it's late for you, but it's, yeah. this has just been beyond what I, even what I thought it would be. So oh. I really appreciate you. We appreciate you and thank you so much. Thank you. I wish I could be there. That's the only thing in New York yes. next time. Next time, <laughs> next time. Yeah. I'll hold you to it too. Okay. <laughs> Bye everyone. Bye.